It's episode 5 and before I get too far into the rebuild I want to have a look at the issues surrounding the torsional rigidity of the chassis. Over the many years that I've been involved with the Sprees, I've seen this topic come up time and time again in discussion forums. So armed with a CAD model and simulation software, I really wanted to show definitively what happens when the chassis is under load and what changes the Sport 300 version of the Esprit brought to the show. To the observer, it's quite apparent that the backbone of the Esprit chassis is the weak point of the structure due to the cutout made for the gear lever. The first rule of simulation is simplify. So let's remove the front and rear sections of the chassis to understand what element is going to be under test. Let's analyse this step by step. This is likely going to be a long video, so please refer to the timeline below. I've condensed the backbone into a basic rectangular beam, keeping the dimensions faithful to the real thing. It has a top section, a folded underside, and a front cap to simulate the interface with the front cross member. In cross section view, you can clearly see the folded return on the underside capping plate. The structure is 152mm wide by 262mm deep and 1.35m long. Steel is selected as the material and is 1.7mm thick with a standard yield strength of 220 megapascals. If any of the stress plots are above this value, the metal is permanently deformed or even damaged. During each test, the rear of the beam is fully fixed as shown by the green markers. All the loads are being made on the front plate as shown in purple. This simulates the forces generated by the front cross member and suspension. I will be looking at measuring the beam in three different loadings, vertical, side and torsion. I will look at the material stress and also physical displacement. Let's look at what happens when 10,000 newtons or approximately one metric ton is applied vertically to this section. It's important to know that the displacement plots are significantly scaled up to easily show what's going on. The level of scaling is shown at the bottom left for reference. This first plot shows the material stress. It propagates from the fixed point at the rear in a predictable manner. None of the material is near the limit, indicating the beam is very strong in this plane. The animation nicely shows the gradual propagation of stress as the beam is loaded. A displacement plot can be viewed to show just how much the beam bends under this load. Maximum deflection is only 3mm, so this is an ideal point of reference. Let's now apply the same force to the side plane. Due to a smaller moment of inertia, the beam should bend more than it did in the vertical plane. The stress plot is slightly higher, but again, no apparent failures. The deflection is shown as 7mm, so for the same load, it flexes over twice as far in this direction. Lastly, a torsion load is applied of 5000 newton meters, as shown by the arrows. As can be seen from the animation, the beam is not really stressed by this force, and the amount of twist is only 0.4 degrees. Note the axis of rotation is not through the centre as expected, it is shifted up due to the folded return in the underside panel. This design is for the ideal construction, but we know this isn't the case in real life, so let's now take a virtual hacksaw to it and cut out the gear lever aperture to see what happens. The same tests were carried out with the same loads on this new model. In the vertical, the stress begins in the same way as the previous example, but also shows stress around the rear of the cutout. The area here has started to turn yellow, indicating it's close to the limit. From the top view, it can be seen that because there is no material to hold the sidewalls together, this area in the top is free to flex outwards. Any more loading and the beam would collapse at this point as the sides buckle. Again, the animation shows this really well. Deflection has risen to 3.4mm, about a 15% increase over the perfect beam. 
Now for the side loading. Ouch, the cutout has caused a complete failure. It is clear to see what is happening here as the aperture has no rigidity against the load in this direction and allows the top of the beam to slew over. It causes more stress in the bottom corners as well as the metal is stretched to its limit. It can also be seen from the top view just how the beam deforms and the result of the lack of integrity in the cutout section. In the displacement plot, the distance has grown by 70% from 7mm to 12mm. Quite an increase. The torsion plot tells a similar story. Note the patch of unstressed material under the aperture. It's not easily seen on later plots, but it is there, and it is the cause of the ripples down the side of the chassis. Another thing to notice is look where the maximum deflection is. It's right in front of the cutout indicating the weakest point. The displacement animation shows this perfectly. Note how this section moves further than the front of the beam when torsion is applied. The only thing left to do now is to add the gear lever mounting plate inside the structure and see how it affects it, if at all. This simulates how a chassis would have left the factory. Within the simulation, the plate is welded into the structure in the same way it is in real life, to give a true representation of what's going on. In the vertical plane, the gear lever plate helps a little. It adds a tiny amount of resistance to bending. But also, because it is welded to the side walls, it stops some of the buckling in that area. Looking inside, you can see the plate has no real stressed areas to it, so it's not helping much at all. The displacement plot shows only the slightest of improvements, a mere 0.05mm decrease, confirming my initial impressions. When the side load is applied, there is no real noticeable improvements over the previous simulation. Looking inside, you can see the corners are fighting the distortion of the beam, showing up as high levels of stress. However, with a gaping hole in the middle, there's not a lot to stop this characteristic slewing. By using the animation, the propagation of this stress can be seen more clearly. Looking at the side, a familiar picture is painted as before. Once more looking at the displacement plot, there is only a fractional decrease of movement as expected. Now for the all-important torsion simulation of the beam section of the Esprit chassis and some important revelations. I had to readjust the scaling here to better show the stress, but you can see anything above green is in trouble. Looking at it from the top, where have we seen this before? The simulation perfectly replicates the stress and areas of damage when compared to the photograph taken of the chassis the real world cracks are propagating exactly where the maximum stress occurs, not just on the large cutout but the stress relief holes and the corners of the main opening as well. Not gonna lie, I was really happy with this simulation and its accuracy. A quick look around inside shows a lot of stress. As stated, anything in green or above is not going to be very pleased, 
Something of a surprise was just how much the gear lever plate lends to torsional rigidity. The twist is massively reduced from 1.8 degrees down to something more resembling the perfect beam. The final value being just 0.5 degrees of twist. I was really not expecting this because it had almost no effect in the other planes. So what is causing this increase in torsional rigidity? I believe it is the front vertical element of the plate. This is resisting the beam deforming around the front of the opening. You can see this clearly in a displacement plot. In the unsupported version it moves 12mm, here it only moves 2mm, and the displacement is spread much more evenly across the front of the beam, moving in unison. Also look at the roll centre, it's right down at the bottom, again showing where the strength really is. So that's it, the front of the Spree chassis has a torsional rigidity of about 0.5 degrees per 5000 newton meters. Well, yes, on the day it was driven out of the showroom. The issue is the huge red areas which we know to cause cracks. So what happens when the metal is cracked? Again, the virtual hacksaw comes into play and I've added some cutouts to simulate the damage to the gear lever plate. When running a torsion simulation, these new stresses can be seen further propagating into the beam sidewall and further into the rear of the gear lever plate as well. This weakens the beam. It won't get as bad as the worst case scenario, but it is significantly worse off having a torsional rigidity of only 1.3 degrees per 5,000 newton meters, or nearly three times less rigidity than a new chassis. You've heard me say it before, it's taken my car 105,000 miles to get to this state, and without doing further simulations and delving into frequencies and simulated fatigue, it's hard to tell where it goes from here, and I do have a car to build. My guess is that eventually you will see cracks into the beam sidewall and increasing degradation in the structure's integrity. I don't know what the all-time record is for an Esprit mileage, but mine is well up there. But these cars are getting used less and less, so again, unless you're driving it hard, it shouldn't really be a problem. One may say, well, hang on, you forgot to simulate the gear lever mechanism. Surely that helps. Well, it's only held in place by a few floating anchor nuts, which are free to move, so no, it's not really going to help significantly. The proof of the pudding here is in the cracking. Enter the Sport 300. Only about 64 of these cars were ever made, and they were the only version of the Esprit to have significant modifications made to the chassis, which is around the gear lever surround and the rear tubular engine bay structure. We'll look briefly at the rear structure later, but let's focus on the parts we're familiar with so far, which is the gear lever surround. The Sport 300 chassis had a different gear lever mount, which had the ability to bolt a reinforcing plate over the gear lever mechanism to strengthen the chassis. It is clearly seen here in the 1994 Le Mans race car as well. The Sport 300 modification is welded from the inside of the backbone at the factory. It is totally impractical to replicate this in the standard chassis, so I've chosen to virtually weld my own bolt plate on from the outside. This plate is 2mm thick steel and would theoretically have threaded inserts welded onto it. They have no impact on the simulation, so they haven't been included here to help simplify the results. The program can simulate the plate being fully welded around the outside to the top of the chassis. On its own it has no effect on the rigidity, so let's just jump straight in with the final test. The capping plate again is 2mm steel with a 100mm diameter hole for the gear stick to move around in. In the real world it would be bolted in place by 12 M8 bolts. But in the virtual world, again, this causes complications, so telling the computer to fuse the two plates together will create the same effect. Again, let's look at the results in the vertical and side planes, and then finally in torsion. Vertical stress is similar to that of the perfect beam. Inside it looks pretty safe, there's hardly any stress registering on the plot. There is predictable stress around the large opening, as the cross section in this location is reduced due to the gear stick hole. The stress is therefore pushed out to the sides. As always, the animation shows nicely how the stress is distributed. 
The deflection is 3mm, the same as the ideal beam, so full strength is restored in this plane. Now for the side load. Again, nothing to really write home about. There is stress around the large hole, but that is to be expected. In the animation you can see that the stress is not evenly dispersed along the sidewall of the beam, but instead it is biased towards the bottom. All that metal at the top is stopping the big cutout from distorting and slewing across. I can already see this is going to be stronger. Deflection is only 6.9mm, slightly better than the starting point due to the amount of material that has now been added to the top of the beam. Lastly, the torsion plot. Stress is creeping up here at the edges of the hole. It's important to keep this to a minimum. A return on the hole, or simply to make the plate thicker, would actually combat this. That said, the improvement is night versus day. Inside, there is no weakness exhibited by the gear lever plate. I would never expect a Sport 300 chassis to crack here. Overall stress is better distributed as was seen in the first example. This is good news. Yes, there are some hot spots, but this is quite an extreme test. If in doubt, one can simply add a thicker bolt on plate. The all important measurement is 0.4 degrees per 5000 Newton meters. So we're back to the point where we started at about 15 minutes ago. Here's a quick recap of the torsion values. In conclusion, the Sport 300 plate resets the rigidity back to where it is in the perfect beam. It also stops any stress and metal fatigue in the chassis, preventing it from getting any weaker. That is its only function. Before I finally wrap this epic video up, I know people want me to look at the rear structure as well. As before, the simulation needs to be simplified by removing parts that have no function or have limited impact on the results. This is the structure I'll be looking at. I have chosen to fully fix it at the front as this is going to be the zero position of rotation on the chassis. Yes, I could simulate the entire thing, but as I said before, I've got a car to build. I will apply 5000 Newton meters to the area roughly where the suspension spring mounts are and look at the results. This is the stress plot. The simulation assumes that between the two suspension mounts there is a fully rigid beam. Predictably, there are only two members on each side being affected here. Importantly, they are not under too much load, which is why you never see failures in the rear of the Esprit chassis. At least I never have. It's important to note that the radius arm mounts could have made a difference here, but I was unable to simulate them in a reasonable time frame, so I just discounted them. The area I'm more interested in is degrees of twist, and in this area, which can be seen from the displacement plot, it hardly moves, so I don't think it's too problematic. The structure bends 2.6 millimeters in both directions, resulting in an angle of 0.35 degrees across the structure with that load applied. Around the internet, a coined value of 5,850 newtons per degree of twist for the Esprit chassis has been banded about. If we take 0.5 degrees for the front and 0.35 for the rear, at 5000 newton meters, we see these values completely plausible for a brand new chassis. The animation from the rear better shows the twisting action. Finally, let's look at the Sport 300 rear engine bay bracing structure. I don't have the true measurements for this, but we'll just have to try and make something approximate based on the photographs. Here is the stress plot. As before, nothing is really weakened. The stress takes a new path through the brace, but as you can see, there's not really a lot going on. So from this, it's hard to tell how well it works. The issue here is there's not a lot of triangulation going on to stop the torsion. It really needs a diagonal strut, but obviously it's going to be hampered by the engine. Displacement is reduced to 1.9mm on both sides, so it does actually help a little, 
rigidity is increased from 0.35 degrees to 0.25 degrees per 5000 newton meters, so a 30% improvement. The distortion can best be seen when viewed from the rear. Before I sign off, here are my final conclusions. The values are worked out by taking the 5000 newton meters torsion force applied and then dividing it by the sum of the angular deflections plus 0.1 degrees as an estimate of the interface structure. A new chassis will have an approximate torsional rigidity of 5880 newton meters per degree. A high mileage example would fall dramatically to 2780 newton meters per degree and a Sport 300 is 6,670 newton meters per degree and it should not significantly lose that rigidity over time. Compare this with the Lotus Evora produced in 2010 at 27,000 newton meters per degree and you start to see the leap in engineering made with chassis design. It's shocking to see just how much rigidity is lost in a backbone due to the fatigue in the gear lever aperture. I'm not really sure why Lotus didn't reinforce this area as standard on all Esprits, given its ease of implementation. It's worth noting that the body of the Esprit also confers some rigidity, but that is outside the scope of this video and another investigation altogether. The Esprit's body is certainly strong, but I wouldn't call it stiff, as anyone who has lifted the car by the body and tried to open the door will attest to. It would certainly add something to the chassis and a physical test might be possible in the future to see this in action. Where it won't add anything is to the rear. There is not enough fixing points to the chassis and the construction does not lend itself to torsional rigidity here. However, it would be fascinating to know for sure. If you have the means, I would definitely perform the modification to the gear lever mount as per the Sport 300. I will be performing a similar modification to my car soon. The rear doesn't give as much of an improvement but if I was bracing the rear, I would not do it without the gear lever aperture done first, as the increase in rigidity would just accelerate the fatigue in this area. If you want any more rigidity, then grab yourself a roll cage. This is obviously the way I'm gonna go, and a similar design study for the cage will be appearing in a forthcoming episode. All I would say is if you're looking for more strength, please don't do something like this. Phew, I knew that was going to be a bit of a mind bender, however, imagine creating the CAD, setting the simulations up and then making a 20 minute presentation on it. You must be mad. Luckily I had some help with all of this from my good friend Jack at Bravo Team Engineering, who helped me with the simulation setup and ensured that I didn't lose my mind too much. Coming up in the next episode. Things get messy. And congratulations, it's a crankshaft. <laughs>